Where can you find gourmet organic coffees, a friendly hometown atmosphere, and beautiful views of Humboldt Bay and beyond? It's Has Beans Cafe, open every day at 2nd and I Street in the heart of Old Town Eureka. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. This is Charles Douglas with the Humboldt Sentinel here at the Access Humboldt Media Center in Eureka. I'm proud to announce that Sentinel Interviews has been renewed for a second season right here in Channel 12. Our first edition is with Chris Kerrigan. He served on the Eureka City Council for eight years, and these days he's taking a bit of time off, but he did take the time out to share with our viewers his thoughts on Eureka politics, why the local left seems to have the habit of losing lately, and what his recommendations are for economic developments and trying to clean up what's left of local politics. Remember, you can always find Sentinel interviews online at youtube.com slash Humble Sentinel. We are every Thursday here at 7 o'clock on Channel 12 and replay every Sunday at 3.30 and Wednesday at 5.30. Chris Kerrigan, thanks so much for coming down to Hasbeen today. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for having me. So, all of Eureka wants to know, what the heck have you been doing for yourself since you uh, managed to uh, escape uh, somewhat unscathed from the Eureka City Council? <laughs> well, I've been uh, spending some, some time on myself, um, exploring some uh, things in private life, and uh, moving forward as far as um, working in some industry, the entertainment industry and um, exploring opportunities there. I still manage a little bit to keep my uh, pulse on the uh, political climate here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been nice to have the time to myself away from uh, uh, public life so much. And especially after eight years and spending the majority of uh, my years in my 20s, uh, 20 to 28, under uh, in public life, it's nice to have that break and that time to, to focus on uh, my endeavors. So. You know, I think it's um, it's nice. It was a nice experience uh, for me to go through, um, but I think you know now at this point I'm able to operate uh, with a lot more perspective in my life, and maybe that's something you know everyone goes through when they get into their uh, get to their thirties. And what would you say uh, you're looking back on uh, with with most pride as far as what you're able to do while while in office? <laughs> well, I think you know it's it's almost uh, it, it it almost seems. Ten years seems to go by, can go by so fa so fast. Um, but I think it, when I look back to what it was like ten years ago when I first came on there, and the the changes that the community has been through um, are significant. And you know, I think I you know it's not a matter of uh, I think you know everyone thinks politicians want to take credit for things. I, I think what the satisfaction I get is knowing you know the part I played and. You know, just having to, uh, you know, a, a role in some of that uh, progress and the changes that we've seen in our community, um, you know, over the over those ten years, you know, makes me feel good. I noticed you uh, you did take exception in a letter to the editor there in the local paper about uh, Jefferson School. You feel like right. maybe uh, your allies in the local left kind of got that one wrong. Well, sure, sure. Um, you know, I think. You know, I think if it, in particular with Jefferson School, um, there were some some mistakes that were made, uh, certainly by the uh, progressives um, and the leadership and in going into that and, and their handling of that. Um, you know, I think the majority of folks look at uh, Jefferson School and, and look at that issue, whereas there's lots of blighted properties within Eureka and. There's obviously a small amount of money 
that we know we, we have public dollars that can go into uh, encouraging investment and reinvestment into abandoned buildings. And to see the way that College of the Redwoods was sort of dismissed and turned away from that site when they came with I mean, well, $1.5 million or $2 million, whatever the, the figure is that they uh, were going to put in uh, to that of ready money, I think, you know, most, most people would, most reasonable people would, would say, you know, you want to you take advantage of that investment and then use the money that you have to go and, and put forth to renovate and, and take care of other blighted uh, properties, which you know, they're uh, throughout Eureka, obviously. Um, you know, I think absent from that discussion was um, that there are a whole lot of people throughout Eureka, a great number of people, and, and Democratic voters or progressive voters primarily uh, included, but, but all, all spec spectrums um, who would benefit from the opportunity or like the, the opportunity uh, to have more educational opportunities, um, whether it's uh, not having to drive uh, to classes out to College of the Redwoods, or uh, just people who who might not otherwise uh, have that opportunity to uh, to go to school. Um, it's also also um, so I think you know missing that 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 representation was absent from the discussion from what I saw, and um, you know so I think it's it's tough. I think that yeah they left a, an opening there uh, for the. Uh, opponents to to criticize, and perhaps gain some traction. And why is there a kind of a, a disconnect between what this neighborhood group, the West Side citizens, what have you, and, and what uh, what would be best for the neighborhood? Why is there a lack of? Well, I, I mean, I, I certainly respect. I, there's a lot of things about the neighbor the neighborhood uh, movement that I respect. I think, and I certainly understand their desire to to want to see the project that they want to see at that location but you know simply when you're when you're elected to represent the entire city you know your perspective has to be broader i you know i think that's what what people are going to look for in elected officials is uh, to bring a broader perspective and that doesn't mean that you can discount the neighborhoods uh, feelings and you know because they have investment in the neighborhood but you also have to take into consideration what's best for the entire city and so you know I certainly you know I think if what the neighbor the neighborhood's concerned about uh, that neighborhood and I don't blame them I think what uh, an elected official has to do in that case is is have a broader perspective perspective and one thing you know about call uh, College of the Redwoods is um, education is something that usually both sides, you know, are going to be in an agreement of it's a, it's a it's not a project, um, you know, that comes with 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 huge downside, um, and uh, and impacts and and you know I, I'm not saying that there there wouldn't be challenges. I certainly would recognize you know from having served eight years on the council, there's going to be challenges with projects of any size. And anytime you're dealing with neighborhoods and uh, bringing in projects, there's going to be compatibility issues. Um, but you know, a good proactive city and leadership would lead the would lead the way in making sure um, that the neighborhood is uh, concerns are heard and that the project fits within the scope of the neighborhood and has um, the necessary uh, enforcement measures in place and proactive measures in place that ensure it works and it's compatible with the neighborhood and also provides you know a, a service to the community as well as uh, improving the property values and I think. You know, I, th I think one thing, I, if, the, if the city moves forward with uh, the neighborhood plan there, I, and, and um, you know, I certainly hope that they're successful in pulling that off. Um, and I think we all, you know, I certainly hope that we would all, once that is the plan, that if that's the plan that goes forward, that, you know, we could get behind that and support and, and hope for their success because, as, you know, taxpayers will be invested in it and uh, we're, all inv we're all invested in it. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I think that's, that's one thing that's really important is that um, as, we move, as we move forward that they have, you know, they have the, su the support of the community, but at the same time, the city council, I think, has to look at College of the Redwoods at other locations. 
um, I, I really don't understand, or, you know, really was critical of, of, it seems like the city should do, well, the city should do a lot more to reach out to College of the Redwoods and to facilitate uh, College of the Redwoods. And, you know, to work, you know, for example, uh, there's been reports recently about green jobs and the increase in green jobs and, and, and um, but we know is, I mean, we've, we've seen the, the direction that the state's going in terms of requiring, uh, future requirement of green uh, buildings and Eureka, you know, can lead the way in terms of manufacturing, consulting, um, not only here by creating demand, cr demand for those services, but also taking advantage of the fact that there's going to be huge demand statewide to meet uh, the, the way the market is headed and the way that the state regulations are headed. And, I, you know, I think you know, working with College of the Redwoods um, and your techno uh, to, uh, with, when you're, with your trades or to improve your trade sector is, I mean, something that a good progressive proactive city council would do. It does seem like, though, just walking around that site, that it is basically a city block with an elementary school and a playground on it, surrounded by a bunch of houses. Mm -hmm. uh, it almost seems like no matter what project you put on there, the lack of city planning decades ago that put that school there in the first place is going to hamper whoever goes there just in terms of parking and traffic. Yeah, there. I mean, I think, you know, I think the point that, the point, what I understand from the neighborhood is that um, you know it's it's what 2005 that the school closed if I remember um, you know it's it sat there empty for so long and I think you know you, you have to look at that now or you know, we have to look at that now as an opportunity and and you know hopefully um, you know call, whether it's called the Red, College of the Redwoods or Whatever project ultimately goes there, hopefully there is a project that can come forward and, and provide an investment. And, and I think that's the thing with College of the Redwoods is, is you know, it would have, it would provide um, a spur, a growth to our to our economy in terms of bringing that those construction dollars uh, down to Eureka, but also that employment, the students that otherwise would be, you know, perhaps driving out to College of the Redwoods. They'd be in uh, close to downtown, and there'd be uh, businesses that would take advantage of, you know, just having those extra those extra students and those extra uh, faculty there uh, working in Eureka. You know, I think that's sort of where uh, Eureka missed the boat in in its history, um, its most recent history. Is Arcade has been very successful at pulling those types of businesses historically out of Eureka, and uh, you know, I think. For all the complaints uh, folks make about Arcata, one thing that they do very well is they provide a consistency. They have a, a vision, an idea, and then a consistency uh, for the most part that that, uh, that folks who want to invest and, and want to uh, uh, do projects can uh, rely on that consistency. And Eureka's traditionally been all over the map and not, not had the most consistent uh, visions. and, and um, you know, so, so we've lost out in that in some respect, but hopefully things will change in the future. Also, there's been some degree of controversy with the, uh, I don't want to say the new president, he's been in a couple of years now, but uh, Mr. Marcy there. And uh, obviously that, that board, of, board of trustees as well, uh, it's not an office you see a whole lot of uh, heated competition for, they hold their elections <laughs> off here and yeah. so forth. Uh, I'm hearing that might be changing uh, in the upcoming uh, off-year election here in 2011. Uh, is that a development you'd like to see where the community is a little more engaged in the future of CR? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime folks are paying attention, I think it uh, leads to, to good, good results, whether it's you know, politicians being more accountable uh, primarily. And, and um, so, yeah, I say anything that sparks uh, interest and participation ultimately will be a good thing, even though that may lead to, to some headaches for uh, for some folks who, who are running. Now you mentioned Eureka's kind of been all over the map. Uh, obviously uh, before Tyson there was kind of a string of city managers, uh, Harvey Rose and so forth, who mm -hmm. didn't last more than a couple of years. Uh, is that part of what you're talking about? <laughs> I remember, you know, ten years ago I walked to for one of the very first doors 
at 20 years old, I walked up to a woman and uh, knocked on her door and, and introduced myself. I was running for council. You know, and she looked at me and said, It'll, Eureka's always been a three ring circus and it's always going to be a three ring circus. And, um, you know, I, I think. I think when you see Eureka, I think, you know, the, the uh, politics are all over the map, um, for one thing. Um, but I think you can get by with that. You can get by with, with, with diversity of views. That's a good thing. I think what a community has to do is identify what they want to be and work together towards that and you know i look back and you know there's so much time and and spent or that i remember spent on you know things that you so quickly forget when you leave office office disagreements that you so quickly forget that you know i would encourage anyone you know who's in office to focus on the things that you can do though that's the things that you're going to remember when you leave um, you know what is it that that you were able to do so you know, instead of spending so much time arguing over it, you know things that are ultimately be, you know shouldn't uh, be given that amount of resources put that time towards working together because there's so much um, that you know a good proactive communities can just go out and get and so you know a lot of times in terms of you know it's just your willingness I think as a community to really identify what you want and be willing to go after it and you know whether you have disagreements you know on uh, um, all the time you know that can actually be a, a good thing I think um, Eureka uh, you know for what for whatever reason um, you know his, historically certainly did not have the uh, uh, does not have a I don't think the um, the history of working with with both sides and working together. Well, it uh, looks like council's set next Tuesday to uh, extend uh, Tyson's contract another couple of years. Uh, is that going to provide stability in uh, an era of pretty huge turnover in the city council with uh, pretty much four out of five uh, new folks up there, or is that something you would regard as a troubling sign? Oh um, no, I mean I think. I vote the, the way I've felt with city managers is it's really, you know, they really serve for the, the, the pleasure of the majority of the city council. So, you know, I think whoever they want to hire, you know, I really give, would give the city council a lot of leeway in putting the person that they feel is the best in place to implement their policies. And, uh, you know, I think that's certainly um, stability is. Um, you know, with with David Tyson is what the majority is most likely looking to, um, and certainly, um, you know, you certainly see the effect of term limits. You know, have is the institutional knowledge is there with staff, um, and the elected officials are often ones uh, with their just their feet in the water and really having to. Um, learn on the go, so that gives uh, you know a lot of weight to institutional knowledge, and uh, that stability. Um, you know, but really, I I think people misplace. You know, I, I saw at least in in my eight years, a, you know, a lot of misplaced uh, anger and disappointment went to the city manager, and really, I think it um, needs to be leveled at the the city council. The city council needs to be held accountable. They're the ones who hire and fire the city manager. And, that's why I think you give them the leeway to, to put in place who they, they want to put in place. But uh, you know, voters ought to hold uh, politicians or the elected officials uh, more accountable. But of course, in Eureka's case, it's not a majority. Uh, it's a four to one vote that right. kind of got set up in Tyson's contract. There. Right. And I, you know, I th would think that would be one of the things that, that uh, potentially could be addressed. And I'm not sure if that is. Um, but I think that certainly and that was a uh, you know, certainly uh, something that I thought this uh, council might address. Um, moving on to uh, where you're hoping the new council is going to go in the future, other than building a big box uh, Home Depot, Best Buy, right. Megaplex down right on the waterfront, and all the wonderful uh, tax money showered upon the city and result of that. What, what are you hoping these new folks are actually going to get done uh, that's going to benefit the majority of the citizens of Eureka? Well, what am I, you know, I think, 
you know, I think you mentioned, first of all, the, uh, the Home Depot and, and the big box project. Um, you know, I still hold out hope that there's an opportunity uh, for the city council to really get all the information that they can. And, you know, I think one of the disappointments is to see both, both sides uh, really engage in this 100% uh, uh, you know, for the project or 100% against the project or really no opinion. And really, I think, you know, I think there are legitimate concerns with any development of that size. And I think there are things that have to be considered in towards mitigate. You know, one of the huge things is going to be the mitigation for, for that project. And so, you know, any uh, good, reliable public servants would want to gather as much information uh, as possible. And one of the things that has really been absent uh, from the discussion has been, you know, how are we going to deal with the traffic? How uh, how are we going to deal with the local uh, impacts to the local economy? How much retail, you know, and ask those really tough questions. I think um, if both sides were able to, to focus the debate more on how we can improve the project, how we can make the project or help make the project as palatable to as many people as possible. But I, ne I never, you know, I don't think it's good to move, uh, first to move down this direction of, um, you know, it's, it has to be all, it has to be all or nothing. And I think, you know, I think if I were still on the council, one of the things that I would want to be working for is let's get a pro let's get a project um, that's really a lo local economic boom to local local businesses or into our local economy. Let's find out what that is and let's offer our assistance to the developer to meet that that vision. Um, I think that would be a, a, a much. I think Eureka would like to see that approach, and that you know that could be approach that. Um, you know that the that those uh, in charge or the uh, new majority and uh, what there's Lin and Linda can can take. Um, you know I think it would lead towards a towards a better result. Um, but it boy the debate does seem to be dominated. You know particularly uh, you know I'm, I guess it's both sides. But you know you see the Mar you see the the way the Marina Center folks marched into the meeting and it's very, you know, reading, you know, very much as, I mean, we can do better than that. We can have a, a better discussion. We can have, a, we, can, we can get a better project, ultimately a better project. And I, I think it's disappointing any time um, folks don't really have high standards for our community, for, you know, the development of our community. It's almost as if, um, you know, there seems to be a mentality uh, often that you know we should take be a, we're so bad we should take whatever we should get we can get and I think that's really a, a dangerous mentality. <laughs> um, you know, I you know I think in particular the Marina Center and what the Arkleys are proposing. I think one you know one thing is is the in, the investment is good. And we want to encourage that investment in our community. In our community, um, but again, the city has to lay out what it wants. What type of community do we want to be, and uh, not not hold not let developers determine that for us. And I, I think we can get a project. You know, hopefully, get a project that uh, that has as much potential economic impact as possible, and really is a win-win for the community. I've always thought. That that was the direct. That's the only direction to go on a piece of property that is that has that many challenges environmentally. Um, you know, there's a re there's a reason that that pro that that property hasn't been developed for so long, and it's a it's a very tough piece of property to develop, and it's gonna take um, you know it's gonna t take the entire community working together um, you know to really I think get a get a project through there. To what extent is this? reflecting how Eureka is just becoming like the rest of California. You're saying Eureka is desperate for anything, but I think we've seen what? development interests take over uh, local governments up and down the coast. I know that happened in my yeah. hometown uh, years ago, and we've seen, you know, basically yuppie boxes built out to the very edge of the property line and, and you know, wipe out the green space, uh, right. certainly where I grew up. 
you don't know what is you know and that's the that's uh, we can all re we you know we all reminisce and and uh, you don't know what you have until it's gone and you know it's um, it's a perspective I th hope that folks gain from you know talking to people outside of the area traveling um, you know I know one thing when I traveled across the country and saw the Midwest and I mean you see communities that where you literally drive through where everything's boarded up and you think and you see where you know, where are the people where have the people gone where have the jobs and um, you know they have become so economically dependent on uh, retail or um, wind or I mean um, Cabela's superstores and so forth that they, they have huge huge leverage and NPR and other uh, there's been other news reports that have you know talked about the or sh showed the leverage um, you know that uh, that retailers will have because they're so desperate uh, for any type of jobs everything is gone and and um, you know I think one of the things you know I lived in Des Moines Iowa for for three months or and and a lot of things there wasn't the diversity of businesses uh, that we have here in Eureka and uh, or and in Humboldt County. I Des Moines think. a couple hundred thousand people. Des, Des Moines is a big city and you know you have more local bookstores here than you do there and you have more you know local hardware stores thing of the past <laughs> you know a relic of the past and here you have that and you, you have a lot of folks um, it's sort of the political dynamic that I mean, you, I mean, your your hometown probably experienced this as well, where um, you know they call it the born here's versus the come here's. But oftentimes, the the political dynamic of uh, is uh, those who are born here and those who uh, chose to come here, and and usually the folks who chose to come here saw something that they really liked about the community and chose to locate here, and they're much going to be much more resistant to, you know, things that might uh, impact that, that quality of life. Whereas, um, you know, the board here is uh, more, you know, traditionally more anxious for change, um, you know, for, for or maybe um, more anxious for a community that represents uh, someplace else. Well, you were born here. Yeah. Uh, you, you grew up here, went yeah, to St. Peter's and so forth. Broke the trend, my own trend there, rule. Just looking up, uh, looking back 30 years, I guess, uh, what uh, was here as a kid that, that you think you're missing now that, that isn't here anymore? I'm sorry, what, what was what? what? What was here when you were a kid that, that, you know, that you reminisce about that simply isn't around here anymore? Besides the pulp mill, of course. Well, you know, I, I grew up, I uh, I remember downtown department stores. I remember uh, we had escalators, <laughs> um, you know, and I, uh, you know, that that's one thing, you know, the sense of community of downtown and old town that I remember. Um, and that was quite a shift, I think, you know, I remember, gosh, if I was 10, or I remember being a kid going, going to the Bayshore Mall when it first opened. And, um, you know, that was a huge display, I mean, a huge change in the way that, uh, that Eureka went, where um, it would have been interesting to see, you know, had that type of investment went into downtown, uh, what, it, what it could be, because I think, you know, what we have now at the Bayshore Mall is a, a lot of vacancies, and what, and what the Bayshore Mall what happened after the Bayshore Mall is it left a lot of vacancies in downtown, and a whole rede the whole redevelopment agency, which is where this money is talked about, you know, that goes to things some, like something makes something like Jefferson School discussion possible. Um, you know that that money. I think I think the figure when I was running for re-election was over over twenty million dollars of redevelopment money had been invested back into downtown. Uh, of taxpayer money to uh, basically to mitigate for the the economic displacement. So you know, folks, you know, folks always say, you know, I think, you know, um, folks will say, well, you, the progressives are against change or that they don't want change, and I think that's that's a false, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a it, the. Um, 
you know, tomorrow it, there can be change. You know, what, what was an ice cream parlor can be an internet cafe, um, but you have the fabric of your community of having that, down, that downtown thriving business sector and uh, all those stores within a livable, walkable community. Um, you know, it's really, really uh, disappointing that we missed that. Um, and there's a huge cost. There's a huge cost to developing outside of the core area in terms of um, what that extends in terms of the, the tax bill um, to, to city residents. And, you know, all of a sudden, instead of being able uh, to work clo close to your house, um, you've got to drive out, and if you don't have a car, you've got to get a car, or you've got to take a bus ride, and now the public, we have to provide more bus services. Um, you know, there's a huge, I mean, and, and really, that changed the hub, that changed Eureka's hub. The, the main transfer point for, uh, uh, for the majority of when I was on uh, city council, the main bus transfer point was the Bayshore Mall. What it is up with the Eureka shifted. bus system? Why does everything have to go to that mall? Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, it was so. I mean, I used to make the point on city council that the the area that I represented to walk for or to get from uh, the house that I lived in to city hall, you had to go down and transfer at uh, Bayshore Mall, which was literally the you know the exact opposite way that you needed to go. I mean, it was it is. You know, it, it, but I think that's, that's, I guess would be my point, is that it, it really shifted um, our, you know, what, we, once, what we sensed as, as our community meeting point. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, I mean, I look back and I have fond memories growing up of going to the Bayshore Mall, um, but I would have liked to, have, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen, uh, um, you know, the, the businesses in downtown. Well, I mean, to what extent are people's choices, the economy, what have you, kind of making that whole situation flip back around? Because certainly the stories I've heard, I wasn't around at the time, but in the early 80s, uh, Second Street was, you know, Skid Row, and the Vance Hotel right. was a flop house, and the building we're sitting in now sold uh, fortified malt liquor to, to the uh, the vagrants. Yeah, so some would debate whether that... <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Uh... I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. <laughs> so well, well, just how it's flipped around. Like Old Town does seem like it's revitalized. Right, and now downtown. And now downtown uh, is needed. In need of more of the investment. Yeah. Well, and now Bayshore, like you say, right. is, is just collapsing. Um, right. You know, so many vacancies. I guess. Right, and the irony there is that you know the the, the community, we will be left with the footing. I mean, most likely be footing the tax bill. <laughs> Of, of of redeveloping now a, a, a piece of property that um, you know I mean I look back it it, it, uh, it certainly is a, you know, built in an environmentally sensitive area and uh, you know could have been restored uh, environmentally you know with good proper planning that investment hopefully could have happened in your old town in your downtown area um, you know I think that would be a uh, the way to, to look at growth and to talk about growth. And I think, you know, one thing the progressive, what, I think the progressives that they've been termed the progressives here locally have sort of um, ran away from the development issue or um, just uh, it's been difficult for them. And uh, you can't get around uh, talking about development if you're going to be in local office. I mean, that's. Uh, that's what, that's what the, you know, the vast majority, I mean, a little bit more when you get to the county, le at the county level, you're looking at uh, other things, but the vast, vast majority are development related decisions, planning decisions. And uh, you need to talk, I mean, you, uh, progressives need to be able to talk, need to talk about how good planning creates a good economy and good jobs. And uh, certainly there's countless examples uh, to, sh to, sh to, to show that and to prove that, but really they gotta be able to talk about it because you know, one of the things 
this community wants is they they want a better con I mean that's you're going to hear that you hear that time and time again when you're out there campaigning or walking door to door is how can we improve this economy and there are countless ways I mean Eureka needs to I, when we talked about green economy uh, the green economy Eureka can lead the way in in, ter in terms of um, small business entrepreneurship and really I mean it's really what you know it's really in terms of uh, it really has to be what you know, we just have to decide what we want to be and then go out and really get a proactive city government to really make you know really foster that type of growth but we ought to be looking to community you know to tech companies that are here already um, green building companies that are here find out what you know how local government can help can help find can help bring in other companies that you know and really have a plan but you know you you can't uh, it's a it's a, a losing battle to uh, to not define that because you, you you let outside forces and in the worst case you let you let outside corporations determine what your community want, what your community looks and, and feels like yeah. and you know what you know what I mean one of the things you talk uh, crime you know I mean it, I think at one point at one point we, there might have been we were looking at um, Opening up a police station or a form of a police station down at the Bayshore Mall. I mean, you look at a crime map, and the the statistically your chances of being in a crime are tremendous. You know, tremendously higher in Bayshore Bayshore Mall's parking lot. Or, you know, and you know, so a tremendous or um, the amount of service of service calls that go out for for theft and so forth. All that goes to the Bay to the Bayshore Mall. It's a huge, huge. Um, you know, those are those developments decisions. You know, create huge, huge drains on your resources, and so that's why you have to. I mean, I think communities really have to think about what um, what they want to be and, and plan for these things. Otherwise, you get left with some huge challenges, and it's just, it's a really sick uh, cycle because you you end up uh, you know one bad decision leaves you chasing more and more. Uh, Dollars, which leaves you more vulnerable to uh, to the to those they come in there with or, you know outside developer interests who can uh, you know come out with with funding and money and you're just uh, it's a sick cycle that feeds itself. Well, the mantra we heard from uh, I guess you know your political opponents, maybe not yours directly, but your team's opponents was that well, government oh. doesn't create jobs, only the private sector creates jobs, right? Well, that talking point over and over, including from a fellow who spent his whole career in the public sector, <laughs> oddly enough. Uh, I yeah. mean, how do, you, how do you beat that other than just saying green jobs? And even I have to ask, well, you know, how's the government just create green jobs? I mean, you know? I think you just, you, I, if you counter it by just telling the truth, is that's never, is, you know, it's more complex than that. You know, I, I, it's just not that simple. The government, you know, ha first of all, all the economic data shows that, that public sector is a huge creator of jobs and all the laws the type of community that you know all these decisions that are made by government it ha play a role in the in in our local economy when we talk about uh, providing I mean in in the link you got to make the I mean the link is there on everything when you talk about programs youth programs that plays a role in terms of uh, quality of life that plays a role in terms of what businesses you know when businesses look to locate um, you know what type of programs it plays a role in terms of what the crime rate is which which plays a role into your economic development so I mean to, to I mean and how I you know I, how I think progressives have to do it or have to explain it is it's is you we can't go back I mean you can't you can't go back to the days where local government doesn't play a role in the economy. That's literally turning the clock back 20, 20, 30, you know, trying to turn the clock back to a time that never existed. And, um, you, you know, what, what, what I think progressives got to talk about is how we can make it better, how government can more, operate more efficiently, how it can provide more services, and how we can work together with their, you know, to, to help our economy. Because I think you, you know, and it's, it's how 
communities that have really be become economically prosperous, it's always been a partnership. Local government is always, pl I mean, is, is playing a role. And the, the days of a resource-based economy with, uh, are, are over. We just, we just don't have that anymore. And we can't, we can't go back to that. We can't, that, that can't, that will never be the, de the determining uh, our economic future anymore. It'll be our innovation. But to some extent, I hear some progressives talking about, uh, well, we need to, you know, reinvigorate our manufacturing base. Well, you know, we have a federal government that's determined to destroy our manufacturing base and ship all our jobs to China. <laughs> How is a local government supposed to be able to stand up to that? Yeah, exactly. Um, tremendous challenges. Tremendous challenges. Um, there's a dwindling, like you said, a dwindling number of manufacturing jobs. Um, but what you got to do is look towards the, the area that, the, where there's a growth sector, solar, um, you know, that have been identified recently in the, in the news. Um, and you really got to look at what, what are going to be these emerging technologies and invest in those. And, but it, you're right, I mean, it just in our economy, it's not going to be as uh, uh, manufacture based or as intensive as perhaps it was, I mean, as it was in the past. That, it's just not going to happen. There's also going to, you know, the large portion of the jobs are going to be in education or consult consultation um, for, for green technologies as well and uh, innovation and development. So um, it's, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly a, a challenge because, um, you, know, no, you know, even Eureka behind the Redwood Curtain, you know, um, we, I think we do a better job of using products that we make. I know, um, I know a lot of folks who, uh, who local vores and, and folks who, who live by that uh, lifestyle, and you know, we do a pretty good job of that, but um, you know, so that can create some demand uh, for manufacturing products. Just, just looking, I, I always you know, try myself to look at um, you know, just making a small shift in the way I spend, uh, we spend dollars um, uh, towards uh, towards buying things that are made local, and uh, just if we just look at a 10 or 15 percent shift of what we normally do, uh, that can make a huge difference, and that can actually uh, you know help. One thing we can do to actually create local jobs, manufacturing jobs, help that create that demand. You mean so you don't drive to Crescent City to grab cheap plastic uh, slave goods at Walmart? <laughs> no, I certainly don't. I certainly don't. Um, you know, and and. But that's not to say, I mean, it's not to say I fault um, folks for going to uh, stores. And I certainly myself shop at national retailers on occasion as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, you have to, the days, the, the, good, old, <laughs> the good old days, are, you know, just are the same. I mean, the economy's changed. And um, again, it's about, you know, to me, it's about making a, a small shift. And really, um, just thinking about the the money that you do spend is like voting. You really can help determine uh, your economic future by determining uh, how you want to spend that dollars and whether you know uh, you want to spend that money in the local economy. Um, and and just having that awareness, I find uh, you know ra rather than blaming folks uh, who do make those decisions, um, is the way to go. So it sounds like you're suggesting that the local left has kind of got itself stuck in a rut. And uh, yeah, what, what I think the results of the election of you know on the last co the last few elections have really really showed that. Um, and uh, the other thing is Democrats have a huge registration edge, and this is a you know so there's a disconnect. But Virginia there's, Bass is a Democrat, right? What do you say? Marion Brady was at the Jerry Brown rally, right? Right. Um, I think Democrats are the the traditional pro or the progressives here have, uh, you know, uh, had to adapt, you know, had to, it's, it's just, it's a very difficult, you're up against a lot. Um, you know, people, if you're going to be in, in an area like here, I mean, it's traditionally the developers have have built this community and they, I mean, they're not, I mean, that's the one thing I found is how um, you know, I'm not, a, I never felt, and most folks who watch me never felt that I was in an unreasonable, 
person <laughs> or unreasonable. And um, you know, I think a lot of folks felt I, I didn't go far enough. Um, but I, you know, I never. I was amazed at the amount of resistance, particularly from the development community, of just any type of questioning, any type of change. Really, you know, created a, a fire. Could create a firestorm. And you know, if you're, it, it's you look at the money that's uh, be, the, the, you know, unfortunately, if, if our elections are going to be privately financed. Um, the development community, you just look at their public disclosure forms and, you know, who they're, don who they're donating, and it's $500, $1,000 checks. I mean, just down the list. And, you know, the, the, so you're up against, you know, they're up against tremendous uh, you know, uh, financial disadvantage. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a dwindling pool of resources to be able to get your message out. So really the party system is effectively broken down. There's very few well, registered Republicans or even Greens or any third parties. Yeah. That, right? Most of them are yeah. Democrats I or, mean, that's, you know, undeclared. That's the thing is the right got, the right, I guess, uh, really got better about uh, their language, their use of language. Um, all of a sudden, uh, they're talking about issues that uh, that I was talking about, you know, that I was talking about as a progressive, and um, and like you mentioned, I mean, now um, it's essentially everyone's shifted to running as a Democrat because for years um, the progressives, uh, you know, could point and say that's a, uh, you know, it's a Democrat versus Republican race, and that was a. A, a, you know, been a clever way for them to, you know, for for to be able to take away that element, and you know, um, and so it's it presents these these new challenges um, for progressives, uh, but you know, it's it's so really it's not a party thing. It's a fund, who's fundraising raising circle or are you in? And, and to be fair, the progressives have their own fundraising circle, and Bill Pearson seems to have a, a lot to do with that. Well, I, I'm, yeah, it's, um, it's basically, I mean, if I, I don't remember looking at the last forums, but wasn't, it, I remember reading, I mean, it's, it's basically Bill Pearson. On the, on the left, it's basically Bill Pearson, and what, I, what I've seen a small, small amount of small donations that you can go and get. I mean, labor unions are a fraction, you know, contribute a fraction of what they once did. So, you know, how do you compete when the development community is throwing thousands of dollars at your, I mean, at your opponent? I mean, it's very tough. You, mm -hmm. uh, you have to create a message. It's very tough. I mean, I did, I, I had to, I mean, I had to face those challenges. Speaking of a couple of candidates who were defeated in this last election cycle, they suggested the way the election was conducted uh, also played a role. That if mm. you looked at where the polling places were in Eureka, if you lived on, let's say, to be fair, the richer end of town, right. your old ward, you know, the, there's practically polling places a few blocks away from each other. Right. Here in Old Town, the first ward, we got a Dorney Center right across the street practically. We got City Hall nearby. Right. They made all of us folks, especially folks who are older, without cars, whatever, go all the way out, way the hell out to the wharf finger. <laughs> Except for some people on yachts, nobody lives there. <laughs> and why would you put a polling place out in the middle right. of an industrial wasteland? Right, right. I, there are certainly... Um, legitimate issues there um, and then you know I would say definitely have to be addressed and then you know are uh, those are very legitimate issues but uh, I can't it's certainly not the uh, reason that you know certainly not the reason that the progressives have lost recently um, you know I, I just it's just been too many def too many defeats after defeats and I really think it'd be smart to look at look at their message and to look at really take some some uh, you know really the next the progressives next pro class of progressive candidates really have to look at what is what what is our message you know what um, and you can't they can't run away from their message I mean I, I don't know what the progressive Message has become recently. I mean, it, um, or in those races. Well, I mean, kill, kill all, all the corporations the uh, didn't seem to work. <laughs> no, I don't think. I, yeah, I don't. I, I think. I mean, I think in terms of um, Eureka has always been a, a 
the Eureka voter, in, in my experience, has always been results oriented and not idealistic. And so um, it's why I think, and you could look at what 2006 in that election, Linda Atkins and George Clark um, essentially ran, or they did, they ran on the same platform with the same policies, the same position papers, and said, you know, I mean, it had this um, essentially the same campaign, yet one got 55% and the other got 35%. You know, it's. Um, a lot your to do approach. with the relative strength or weakness of their opponents, though. I'm sure you'd agree. Obviously, Frank Hager's had a degree of public service that people respect as a coroner, police officer, and so forth. Yeah, well, well cer certainly, certainly uh, that, that plays a part. It's well, speaking there. of the way elections were held, uh, I did the numbers, and uh, Ron Cunnell won his ward. He won Ward 3. Uh, not with a majority, but, but he did a good plurality compared mm -hmm. to Mike Newman. Mm -hmm. And I asked Newman about that, and well, it's a citywide election. That's the way it breaks down, right? And, you know, too, yeah. Too I bad, mean, so sad. But. Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, it is what it, it is what it is. I know that, you know, I think some conservatives could point to the fact that I represented as, you know, as a liberal or a Democrat, the most conservative area within Eureka. And I remember, you know, I, I won the ward that I represented in my reelection, but I run it just barely, <laughs> not, not compared to uh, how I did in other areas. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So that was a real failing is they, they got the initiative going to get true award voting going right. and then they just failed to get their signatures in on time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, there's a reason that the system hasn't changed and it's going to be very difficult to change. And I think, you know, even had they do that, it faced a tremendous uphill battle in uh, getting approval to, to make a change like that. And, I would have probably leaned towards uh, definitely supporting it, and you know, there's certainly a real benefit towards having uh, your elected representative re just represent your area. But I think, you know, right now you would have had to overcome the argument most folks, I think, or a lot of folks would have had, which is, right now I get uh, get to vote on all five of the wards, and you're asking me to now just to get vote to vote on one ward. And I think that would have been a very difficult challenge to overcome, and, and you could have made a lot of uh, explanations about how a true ward system would have led to better representation, but ultimately, you know, it would have been a tough. It would have been a tough sell. And, and the other thing uh, that you and Mike Jones actually co-sponsored a town hall meeting on yeah. a few years back was ranked choice voting. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it seemed like that was all, Mike was even in favor of it. Obviously, you were in favor of it. Yeah. it seemed ready to go, and then uh, Measure T came up, and we all got distracted with that waste of time. Well, I, I, you know, I think ranked choice voting really would have been. It really provides a solution to. I mean, uh, you know, something that you know, it's something that could actually be implemented, um, that could actually work, and it's very. Um, you know, right now, you, Eureka doesn't have a runoff system, so you can dilute the vote. You can you can win with less than fifty percent of the vote. With a simple, you can win with a simple plurality. And we've had cases where, you know, folks get elected with thirty six, thirty seven percent of the vote. Um, and so the the the, bene, the benefit of uh, you know normally you would say well we'd have a runoff system to take the top two vote getters. And uh, go forward with, an, just like the county does, with the runoff. So we ensure that one person gets over 50%. Um, and the disadvantage to that system is you have to go through two election cycles and it's extended, and the candidates have to raise more and more money. Well, ranked choice voting or preferential voting just allows you to do that for the for, to essentially do two, those two elections in once and by ranking your candidates. So. You're, uh, if there are three candidates ranking or running, you can rank your top. You rank your top two, and, or, and uh, perform once. If if your top vote getter isn't the one, it isn't one of the top two, your your next vote uh, gets put towards it, and the elections uh, determined all in one. And it's, you know, it's the it's just the uh, 
the fairest, easiest way. And a lot of people make the argument that it leads to uh, to more public discourse, invites more people to get involved, and um, you know, certainly in a situation where you know, uh, the canal, uh, canal, and Xandra Mans and um, uh, Mike Newman, you won't have that argument of the spoiler effect. Um, folks can simply run, and that's the way it ought to be. You know, folks ought, especially, at, I mean, if, if not at local, in local government, then where, you know, where else should anyone else, anyone should be able to run? I mean, it should be a pretty liberal standard. Uh, so you should be able to run. You should be and not not be accused of uh, of ruining the ruining the race, or, you know. Uh, How do you ruin politics in America? It's so spoiled already. Right? Yeah, right. That's a tough task. Well, yeah. so uh, you already told me you're not going to run again, so I'm not going to put you on the spot there. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you told me before <laughs> the interview, but uh, do you think uh, uh, fronting for that sort of reform effort, something that's more of an initiative or a policy proposal, rather than putting yourself on on the ballot as as yourself, is that where you, you think you're going as far as Eureka politics? Uh, or not? Um, you think you say that again? I'm sorry. I, if you if you're not interested in putting Chris Kerrigan on the ballot again, um, what do you think you're going to get involved in as far as civic affairs, whether it's a ballot initiative or some sort of public policy role, planning commission, what have you? Um, I don't have any ideas in that. You know, um, I'll be continue to be involved in issues I care about, and I'm certainly my uh, my. I always keep my phone on, and uh, for those if they have folks have any advice, and I'll certainly be willing to lend my advice uh, to any folks who want to listen. Um, you know, as far as uh, my future in public life, I mean, I I do see a time where that'll be something I want to get back into. Um, you know, it, but it'll be done, and it'll be uh, you know, it'll be. I'll know when you know when that time is, and, and it's not not now. Well, when that time comes, be sure to let us know. All right, Chris Take Kerrigan, care. thanks so much for yeah, coming thanks. into Hasbeens. Bye. Hi, this is Larry Jackson, Blue Ox Radio. We're down here, we're just cranking it out 24 hours a day for your enjoyment. And we sure hope you like what we're playing. We, we welcome your suggestions. If you want to get involved, that's good too. We can always use more volunteers. I'd like to thank the folks at Prometheus Radio for giving us a hand getting this station started. I mean, this is radio the way it used to be. Probably the way it should be. Non-commercial, community-driven, 